team for this magnificent group. Um, and we welcome you to May's program with Dr. Mary O'Donnell. I'd like to introduce Mary uh, very briefly. Um, Mary O'Donnell is Massachusetts based in the United States. She is a doctorally trained and just um, uh, completed her doctoral degree in occupational therapy in 2022. She currently works full time as a uh, lecturer and in, as a faculty member at the MGH Institute of Health Professions located in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm going to pitch it off to Mary and we'll take questions at the end. I'm also going to drop an attendance link in the chat, but not for a few minutes to make sure that everybody has arrived. So thanks, Mary. I'm gonna take myself off of video. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and, and Kate for hosting these events and for having me. I'm really excited to be here today and, and share a little bit about um, some of my work in just um, the area of occupational therapies role, um, working with the homeless population. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm uh -huh. a, a Boston-based uh, occupational therapist, um, <clears throat> and today I'm really just going to talk sort of broadly about occupational therapy's role in homelessness, how I started sort of working in this realm, um, and then talking a little bit about a particular type of advocacy that I uh, worked on here in Massachusetts. So here's our learning objectives for today. We're gonna to be defining homelessness. And I'll just note here that um, I'll be using the United States definition as defined by our Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, but I'm sort of curious to hear how others sort of define and understand the concept of homelessness and would love to hear from folks throughout the presentation about that. We're gonna be talking about barriers to occupational participation for individuals or groups experiencing homelessness, and then outline some steps that the profession can take working with individuals with, or with groups, um, as well as some advocacy steps. So Sarah gave me a lovely introduction, but I'll just briefly share a little bit more about myself. I've been an occupational therapist for about six years, and I, primarily working in pediatric settings. I've worked in outpatient pediatrics and, and home health. Um, so peds is really um, my love. Uh, about a year ago, I transitioned into a part-time faculty role at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. And I'm now there as a full-time faculty member teaching pediatric uh, and clinical coursework. Um, I completed my post-professional degree at the MGH Institute and my master's in occupational therapy at Boston University, both here in <clears throat> Boston, Massachusetts. I'll talk a little bit more about service related to advocacy. Um, but advocacy is really a big passion of mine um, and has been since I was a student. Um, so along with Sarah and another colleague in uh, here in Boston, we started a special interest group within our state association, um, specifically dedicated to advocacy. And the goal being really to engage community members, <clears throat> uh, Massachusetts-based occupational therapy practitioners, occupational therapy assistants uh, and students in the advocacy process. So really to learn more about the policies that are governing what we're able to do here and are governing our education um, and trying to really engage the masses in, in collective change for policies and programs that we care deeply about. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about this later, but I'm also a member of the AOTA Homelessness Community of Practice and I serve uh, in a non-traditional OT role at a local adaptive sports program where I'm a ski, ski instructor uh, and a, a supervisor for OT students. So I sort of wanted to kick it off by sharing my why. Why is this an area that I'm passionate about and how did I get involved with homelessness and advocacy? Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist and uh, have been working in an outpatient pediatric clinic for the last four years and was working there when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And so like many others, we had to sort of pivot and transition to telehealth. We actually closed the clinic for a few months. Um, 
And this is sort of where this all began. Uh, the clinic is located in a upper middle class suburb of Boston. Uh, and traditionally we get a, patients of a, a medium uh, to higher socioeconomic status. Um, but what I was finding during the pandemic was we were getting some families who were either traveling quite far to come to the clinic um, or who were doing telehealth visits from temporary residences. And these were families who were experiencing homelessness. And the families um, were having a really hard time accessing early intervention services. So services for their children under three who were at risk of developing or who had a, a disability or medical condition. Um, so we were getting these families coming to our outpatient pediatric clinic, traveling an hour plus, um, taking public transportation to come to us um, or zooming in from, from the hotel rooms that they were temporarily staying at. Um, and so this was concerning, concerning to me and learning more from the families and from members of the community who work with the homeless population. I learned that this population was experiencing pretty significant challenges accessing early intervention services even before the pandemic. So these families were either not getting the services in the first place due to policies and procedures that excluded them from the process. Um, or they were moving residences so frequently that the services that they might have initiated um, were lost when they transitioned to a new uh, housing environment. Uh, so this was really concerning, um, and I really wanted to understand how we could sort of break down that barrier a little bit more, knowing, um, you know, that that sort of first three years of life is so critical to, to brain development to establishing healthy relationships and to learning um, and really feeling a strong pull to try to bridge that gap to get these sort of health promoting services early on. Um, so at that time, I was also working on my doctoral capstone project um, and decided to take, uh, take a deeper dive and learn more about the problem and come at it from an advocacy perspective. So there were so many different ways to tackle the problem. I could have created a program within our clinic specifically targeting this population. Um, but when I was looking sort of more broadly, zooming out at the policies in our state that mandate these services, uh, I couldn't help but ignore the fact that certain policies were really exclusionary to this population and preventing them from getting services um, sort of across the state. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that specific project, but that's sort of how I got involved with the homeless population and advocacy, uh, despite not working in an organization that uh, explicitly serves uh, or exclusively serves uh, this population. So next, I'm going to just briefly define homelessness. And again, this is how we define it um, in the U.S. based on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's definition. Gabriel. And this hey. is sort of the, the first big definition, the one that we might think of when we think of the term homelessness. So an individual or a family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence someone whose night primary nighttime residence is a public or private space not designed as regular sleeping, so street or a tent, um, and folks who are living in shelters. And so feel free in the chat or you can unmute, um, just maybe share, does this align with what you think of as, as homelessness? Uh, are there other characteristics that you think of when you think of this term? Um, would you define it a different way? or do you define it a different way where you are? I'll just pause for just a second. Sarah, if there's anything that comes through the chat, let me know.
Yeah, I see no place of abode. Great. So the reason I share this here is because um, we also define homelessness uh, in terms of other characteristics um, that I'll share here. So our um, Department of Housing and Urban Development also defines homelessness as an individual or family who will imminently lose their housing, meaning someone who has received an eviction notice or who is um, at risk of losing whatever residence they're staying in um, and will not have residence for the um, within two weeks. We also define it as someone whose primary residence is a hotel and who lack the resources to reside there for more than 14 days or two weeks. It also encompasses individuals or families who have experienced a long-term period without living independently in permanent housing. So these are the folks that might be popping around, living with friends on their couches, staying with family in various locations, or they might be going in and out of, of um, temporary residences like shelters, uh, hotels, or um, apartments. And then finally, we also define it as individuals or families who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. And I include these definitions because they really broadened my understanding of, of what homelessness is and how many of the people that I'm working with might actually fall into these categories. And so my prior knowledge of, of sort of this concept was really that first definition that I shared, um, but taking a broader lens and looking at all these different characteristics that could qualify someone, um, it really made at least me think about um, how many of the families that I work with at the pediatric clinic um, could, could easily fall into these categories um, and that I, I might not know if somebody is experiencing homelessness um, or imminently at risk of losing their housing. All right. So I just wanted to provide a few examples of the scope of this problem of homelessness here in the United States. So in 2019, almost 600,000 individuals were experiencing homelessness in the U.S. on a given night. Uh, the way that uh, we, we count this is through something called the point in time count. So we do a survey on one given night in the United States and tally folks who are living um, in shelters. Um, and so this number was, was shockingly high to me um, uh, when I first read that. Another interesting stat is that about 19% of those experiencing homelessness were children under the age of 18. So again, as a pediatric occupational therapist, this was a staggering, uh, a staggering stat to me, given that I work with these children in an urban um, setting. Um, so again, there's, there's a lot of children out there, um, at least here in the United States, that fall into this category. And then the last one is that approximately 35% of those children experiencing homelessness fall within that one to five-year-old range. So again, this was, was really concerning to me given what we know about early childhood brain development and the impact of early experiences on learning and development across domains, learning motor skills, learning language skills, um, the fact that about a third of the children experiencing homelessness fall within this category. Um, is pretty shocking. So here I just wanted to touch on, um, you know, obviously homelessness is a is a broad category that touches many different groups and types of people. Um, so here we sort of define it uh, different groups, and each group sort of has unique occupational restrictions and needs. So there's folks that are living in shelters. There are families experiencing homelessness youth, so adolescents, uh, children, domestic violence survivors, individuals experiencing mental illness or mental health challenges, and veterans. So again, each one of these groups has really unique needs, and defining the homeless population broadly um, 
um, doesn't really help us to know what the needs of each group are. So I'll talk a little bit later about some interesting programs and interventions that target particular groups. Um, but this is just to say that all the different groups that that um, that might be within this category have really unique needs um, that require pretty unique evaluation and intervention approaches. So next, I wanted to touch on the concept of occupational deprivation. And um, this is a concept that was coined by a couple of researchers, Elizabeth Townsend and Ann Wilcox. And they're sort of the founders of the concepts of occupational justice, occupational injustice, and occupational rights as they relate to really addressing systemic social ex uh, exclusion, deprivation, and other marginalizing social practices. Um, and so occupational injustice is this sort of overarching term that encompasses many different concepts, concepts like occupational alienation, occupational marginalization, occupational imbalance. Um, and it's really just this broad term that relates to the denial of opportunities to engage in purposeful activities necessary for health and well-being. And looking specifically at occupational deprivation, this is a term that's used to define um, uh, the concept of social exclusion by restricting a population, um, so such as those in prisons, refugee camps, um, those in isolating circumstances from participating in occupations that promote health and well-being. And so this is really the driving concept um, that, that I think sort of highlights the unique challenges that folks who are experiencing homelessness um, face, really restrictions in um, opportunities to participate in those meaningful activities because of this sort of unique um, isolation um, or restriction in um, daily contexts. And so how does occupational deprivation really look for folks who are experiencing homelessness? Um, I'll sort of talk broadly here about the, the population um, here in the United States, but if folks have other ideas um, about what this might look like where you are, please feel free to drop that in the chat or unmute. Um, so when we think about meaningful occupations and the experience of homelessness, um, there's this sort of restriction in opportunity to engage in those daily activities. So um, folks who might be living in a shelter or on the street or in a temporary residence, such as a hotel or a trailer, um, might have poor autonomy in um, opportunities to choose um, daily living activities like dressing, cooking, um, uh, leisure participation. Um, so there's not as many opportunities to actually choose those things that they want and need to do um, because the priority is really placed on, on safety and managing one's own um, personal belongings. Um, so again, there's limitations on personal choice. If you think about um, living in a shelter, um, your routines are sort of dictated by shelter rules and and routines there. So there's a particular time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, there's only access to a certain number of activities. Um, if you're out on the street, um, you're participating in the activities that you have to do, not want to do. Um, so there's, there's not a lot of autonomy in choosing um, what someone's day looks like uh, and what things they can participate in. Uh, again, the priority is really placed on safety and managing one's personal belongings. So um, being able to safely navigate some your own environment, being able to keep your belongings safe and yourself safe, your children safe if you're dealing with children. In terms of IEDLs, so things like laundry, meal prep, um, again, pretty limited um, opportunity A to participate in those things and B to have choice in how they're done. Um, so if you're in a shelter and you have particular dietary needs or particular routines or rituals that are involved in meal preparation, um, you don't have a lot of autonomy in actually being able to do those. Um, same, same goes for sort of religious practices. Um, 
there's not as much space uh, or time or selection of um, sort of when activities can occur, um, which can really limit uh, that meaningful participation. And then finally, this population really experiences stigma, marginalization um, that can, can further limit uh, participation in meaningful activities. Uh, we know that um, facing discrimination and marginalization can negatively impact um, health, quality of life, social interactions, and well-being. So here I've just highlighted a few practice settings where we might see folks who are experiencing homelessness and might be working with this population. Places like community organizations, healthcare for the homeless organizations, if those exist where you are, schools, hospitals, outpatient clinics. But I'll just pause here and, and ask folks, are there other settings that you think you might be working with uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness? Or does anyone here work with folks who are experiencing homelessness or think you might? So I'll just pause and feel free to drop it in the chat uh, or unmute yourself. Any other types of settings where where you might be working with individuals, families, or groups who, who might be experiencing homelessness. So I put this here, I sort of left it open-ended because I think what I've realized is that um, um, this could really be a population that we're serving in any practice setting. Um, I certainly didn't expect in our outpatient clinic to be seeing so many folks who were facing housing insecurity. Um, during the pandemic, I was working with families who uh, lost their apartments because of financial challenges, um, who were couch surfing with other family members or friends um, or who um, had been experiencing homelessness. And I just didn't know uh, until, until I got to sort of see their home environment um, or lack thereof through a Zoom screen. So uh, I'm going to speak in a moment about how we can sort of document and, and assess housing status. Um, but I guess my point here was more, um, you might not really know um, until we ask um, uh, if if these folks are are already our our clients or our patients, um, and it's important to know that because they might have these really unique restrictions in their autonomy, uh, in their access to resources, and those are considerations that we really need to know when we're making recommendations for our plan of care. Great, I see in the UK, some OTs work alongside the police. That's really interesting. Great. <clears throat> so over the next few slides, I'm just gonna share a few considerations that I've learned um, from folks working with uh, individuals and groups experiencing homelessness um, in terms of the, process, the occupational therapy process. So I'll briefly chat about um, considerations for evaluation, and then considerations for intervention approaches and how we can sort of tailor these um, using our knowledge of the unique needs uh, of individuals and groups experiencing homelessness. So first and foremost with evaluation, we really need to be documenting housing status. So here on the right, I've included a, a snapshot from the electronic medical record that we use at the clinic that I work at. Um, and we recently included um, these new uh, social determinants of health sort of um, little ping things. And um, we screen all of the clients that we see for 
all of these social determinants of health. And this could come at a primary care visit, um, but if they're not filled out, we might be doing it at an occupational therapy initial evaluation. And so there's particular questions that we're asking and an algorithm basically that determines uh, their risk, risk status um, in each of these social determinants of health. And so you'll see here that we have residential stability, um, social determinants of health tab. And um, we are asking questions as uh, sort of outlined by our definition of homelessness. And so some of the questions are, are you worried about losing your housing in the next 14 days? Um, how frequently have you been worried about um, not being able to pay rent? Uh, are you staying with friends or family? Um, and so making sure that we have that documented really helps everybody on the care team know, um, A, how can we help this family access the resources that they need? So if they're involved um, with a social worker, um, making sure that they uh, are connected with those sort of care coordination pieces so that at the very baseline, we can help connect them with housing resources. But it also quickly gives us a snapshot um, of how they're doing. And um, that consideration as we're going through the evaluation helps us have that lens. And so if this is documented, I, I might not be, I might sort of be changing the questions that I'm asking related to the home environment um, so that I'm more inclusive of what a home environment might look like for different folks. When we're uh, doing our evaluation, we also want to consider how we can have, again, a culturally sensitive occupational profile. So we want to be using inclusive language if we know that a family or an individual is experiencing homelessness. So not asking about, um, you know, how many stairs do you have to get into your house, um, but considering how we can change that language to be a little bit broader and more inclusive. So tell me about where you're staying. Um, tell me about how you get in and out of the building. Um, so keeping that language a little bit broader. Uh, we also want to avoid re-traumatization by approaching those conversations in a non-judgmental way, right? So we don't know why or how folks become homeless. And so we want to avoid any language that um, that is stigmatizing uh, of that experience. I also wanted to highlight a pretty cool and unique um, uh, standardized assessment. Folks might be familiar with the activity card sort. Um, historically, it was a tool that was used for community dwelling older adults to identify changes in occupational participation and to create an occupational history and, and kind of guide um, goal writing. And so some researchers here, um, I believe at Washington University, created um, a supplemental activity card sort called Activity Card Sort Advancing Inclusive Participation. And this includes something that they have called non-sanctioned occupations. And um, they've defined non-sanctioned occupations as those that are deemed either socially unacceptable, unhealthy, or illegal, um, but hold meaning for individuals. Um, and so some of these occupations are things like protecting one's belongings, um, I think it also includes things like drug use and um, other sort of occupations that we might not typically think about when conducting an occupational profile, but that are incredibly meaningful to a person's um, life. And so they created this tool um, specifically with the homeless population in mind. Um, and the goal here is, is sort of really helping to reduce the stigma around these occupations and building rapport with a client so that they know that um, these are things that they have to do and, and that we understand that and we want to know um, how they're doing them. So um, here's just a snippet of one of the cards in this, um, in this uh, modified version of the activity card sort. So you'll see um, this one is related to protecting my things. So it's asking someone, how do you protect yourself or your things? Do you have access to a locked space? How do you carry your things? Um, so this is just one example, and I think it's a nice tool to think about. Um, a, it's visual, so it, it's um, a nice inclusive way to talk about occupations for folks who, you know, might be more of a visual learner. And then B, it just includes some of these occupations that we might not think about as uh, as daily activities um, because we don't do them, 
um, but that are really sort of critical to the day-to-day -day of some folks who are experiencing homelessness. Great, so then just continuing about um, the evaluation process, we also have to ask about and really try to understand the context that somebody is living in. And again, this can really vary depending on housing status, whether it's a shelter, the street, um, a temporary residence. But we wanna know what are the physical demands of the environment and how are you accessing your environment? Um, do you have access to private spaces? And if not, um, how can we help you create some private spaces to do those things um, that require privacy? And are you worrying about personal safety? <clears throat> and again, these are things that we can help with um, and we can connect folks with other resources to help with. When we think about client factors, we're doing all those things that we always do in an, in an initial evaluation and trying to understand the person's motor skills, their cognition, their processing. Um, but we also have to consider health literacy or just literacy skills in general um, to know, um, do you understand the information that I'm telling you? And how can I adapt the information so that you can better understand it? And then of course, we're assessing performance skills and performance patterns. Um, but we're doing this with the context of knowing that there might be a lack of resources um, or there might be restrictions in required routines, um, and particularly for those who might be managing chronic conditions. So uh, if we're working with folks with um, diabetes or other chronic health conditions, um, do they have the resources uh, and the time within their day to really be able to manage those conditions? And if not, how can we help them to define and better create those routines? Um, and then we're also considering what supports a person might need to transition to various settings. So if we're working with someone in a hospital setting um, and we learn that they are homeless, um, how can we help them transition to a safe environment if they have a, a hip surgery or um, some sort of condition that would deem them quite unsafe to be in an environment without support? Great. So next I'll transition to just briefly talking about some considerations for intervention. And again, we're talking really broadly here about a, a, a quite broad population, um, but these are some sort of big categories of considerations that I've learned from folks working with these populations as well as um, from what we know from the literature. <clears throat> so uh, obviously we're always striving to provide choice and respect for an individual's priority when we're developing our interventions. And so that really involves us trying to reduce our, uh, our, our sort of um, assumptions and biases when thinking about what might be important to somebody. Um, so when we're going into intervention planning, we might think that being able to put on your clothes independently or complete a meal preparation activity might be important, um, but we really have to understand from the individual or the group's um, viewpoint, um, is that the most important to you right now? Or is it making sure that you have access to a telephone for communication? Is it that you have access to um, a safe private space to uh, do uh, religious uh, observance? Um, we really have to understand um, <clears throat> from somebody else's perspective, um, what is at the at the top of that priority list. And then we're also considering what skills um, might be relevant and realistic to that person. So for example, we might be shifting our focus to prax practicing um, accessing community-based health resources um, versus, again, those ADL skills. So we might be helping folks to um, set up appointments or navigate their community environment to go to the local uh, health clinic. So again, shifting um, shifting the target of the intervention to skills that are going to be realistic and practical um, for that person. Um, when I was working with a, a couple folks during the pandemic who were families experiencing homelessness, uh, they were living in a, a hotel as a temporary resident. Um, and so while I had lots of ideas for activities 
to help, you know, promote their child's um, fine motor skills, we really had to shift and first make sure I understood that the family um, um, had routines that were meaningful to them, like reading and bath time, um, and then really using the resources within their hotel environment to come up with activities and games um, that could promote development. So we used balls of tinfoil, we used tissue boxes, we used um, pulling to stand at the edge of the bed, and um, so really adapting to the specific needs and priorities um, of them at that time. Uh, we obviously are always thinking about care coordination, so referral and follow through of social service agencies. Um, we did a lot of coordination um, with local nonprofit groups that were providing um, both housing and food resources. We're also helping folks sign up for health insurance coverage and sharing with them resources that um, that they were eligible for through our um, through our state uh, health insurance coverage. And then finally, we always have to think about through our documentation, really highlighting folks' strengths, their resilience, and their adaptive skills, rather than um, focusing on differences in ADL performance through our sort of lens of privilege. So I'll pause there. Any questions so far? I have a question, if you don't mind, um, sure. for the activity cards or inclusive version, is that available for like, can we purchase that, do you know, or is it still in the like in the development phase? That's a great question. I believe it is available. Um, they first started studying it in 2020. Um, so I believe it is out there and available at this point. I, I love that. I hadn't heard of it. So thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Absolutely. Great. All right, and so I just wanted to quickly highlight a couple of sort of unique intervention approaches that I um, have heard about or talked about with other folks. So I think with any sort of marginalized or underrepresented group, it's really important to think about participant-driven interventions. Um, so there's lots of different examples of this with the homeless population. There was one that um, was looking at specifically folks who are at risk of food insecurity. Um, and some researchers use participatory action research to really include the participants' voices and needs and skills within um, the development of a program to address um, this problem. Uh, I'm working with a doctoral student right now who is developing a, a parent group in a local um, homelessness organization where she'll be partnering with parents experiencing homelessness as um, as essentially train the trainers. So they'll be helping to train other participants um, uh, on a program to address parental self-efficacy. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that I think it's really important um, um, to really highlight the voices um, of these folks and include them in, in, the, um, in the intervention um, uh, approaches that we're creating. Um, we also have to think about not just individual interventions, but institutional and community level uh, interventions. So really thinking about health promotion. So there's some unique examples of mobile health um, units. So therapy on wheels um, and considering how we can really be accessing these folks um, more frequently. So uh, here in Boston, we have an organization called Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And currently they don't have any occupational therapy practitioners on staff, um, but uh, there's lots of examples of OTs starting to infiltrate primary care settings. And I think that's a really unique and interesting consideration to think about. Um, how can we connect with these folks uh, in their sort of regular doctor's visits to understand uh, how to support their daily occupations, uh, help them to feel more autonomous in, and empowered in choosing things that we know will help to promote their well-being. All right, next I'll just sort of briefly touch on advocacy. This is a passion of mine and um, something I think we can't ignore, particularly when we're talking about marginalized communities. Um, so 
advocacy can happen on so many different levels. We can think about advocacy for individual clients and or families. We can think about advocacy on a community level, so advocating for programs or policies to improve access to services. And then we can also think about advocacy sort of on a institutional or on a on a national level when it when it comes to policies. Um, so on, on a sort of community or individual level, I guess, we can think about advocating um, for improvements to shelter policies to enhance occupational engagement. So things like their intake processes, um, how they are uh, mandating curfews, um, their access to resources and activities. Uh, I'll talk about it in just a moment, but one thing that I looked at was how we're screening for developmental delays um, in shelter intake uh, and how we can sort of improve that screening process. Um, we can engage and should be engaging with interprofessional teams to really understand how to reduce stigma and improve um, inclusive practices. So uh, I'm a member, like I mentioned, of a, um, a national AOTA homelessness community of practice. That's where I learned about the activity card sort. Um, and um, it's within that group that I've learned a lot more about both unique programs that are happening for this population, um, but also just an area to share uh, to share challenges and to learn from other people um, who might have some ideas. We also need to think about how we can capitalize on funding, either from uh, grant funding or university resources to sort of develop programs to meet the gaps that this population is experiencing. Um, so again, I'm working with a student who will be developing a group within a community organization, but I think we have to think about um, sort of how we're, we're leveraging our power and privilege um, within the roles that we hold uh, to help create some unique programs for this population. So next I'll just share uh, just briefly a, a little bit about advocacy on a policy level um, from an example here in Massachusetts of some work that I've done. Um, so I mentioned that, um, that what I found through my research and through working um, in pediatrics was that children here in Massachusetts who were experiencing homelessness having pretty significant challenges accessing early intervention services. So um, these sort of health promoting uh, developmental services for children birth to three years old. Um, and this was a problem certainly exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but, that, um, but that existed far before that. And so, like I mentioned, I, I really wanted to tackle this from a, from a policy lens. Um, this was, uh, not a unilateral decision, but one that came from many, many meetings with uh, community members and stakeholders who work with this population and who felt that really change would not come unless policy change happened. Um, so really that uh, the only way to really improve this was to put something in writing and to put it into a bill so that our legislators and policymakers and decision makers here in this state had to make, uh, make change. So that's what I did. I connected with um, folks in different community organizations, working with the homeless population, um, healthcare for the homeless leaders, folks within our early intervention system, as well as legislators, so policymakers here in Massachusetts, um, and established those relationships to really, one, better understand this problem, and two, understand how to, how to tackle it. And so with those stakeholders, I actually wrote and proposed some policy changes. Um, and those policy changes included mandating that children who enter shelter receive developmental screenings. Um, so that's sort of that first step of capturing any children who might be at risk of developing a disability. Um, the other uh, piece of the policy would be that any child who, who is um, considered homeless would automatically qualify for early intervention services. And this is because we know there are so many risks associated with experiencing homelessness at a young age um, that, that could qualify someone as being at risk of developing a, a developmental delay or a disability. So we're not trying to stigmatize these children further, but really to say that it, um, that they are eligible for and can receive this really health promoting in intervention early in life so that they won't need it 
later in life when they're in school or um, older. So we're trying to sort of capture them early on to prevent delays later. Um, so this bill, um, these pieces of, of policy were sort of tucked into an existing bill um, that was reintroduced in, in the most recent legislative cycle here. Um, and we're just waiting. Now it's a waiting game and, and an advocacy game of trying to continue to push forward this piece of legislation through continuing to connect with legislators here in our state um, to lobby for this bill passing. So just wanted to provide that example of um, this really was a grassroots campaign on my end of identifying a problem, really learning from others that they felt passionately about this same problem um, and connecting with folks who could actually put this into a piece of legislation um, that we're hoping to pass. So just one example of, of sort of grassroots advocacy. So finally, I just wanted to sort of highlight some next steps for the profession, um, things that I've been thinking about and learning about from other uh, members of, of the communities of practice that I'm in. Um, here in the United States, at least, we feel like we need to really infuse advocacy, cultural humility, and trauma-informed care throughout our entry-level OT and OTA coursework. Um, I think that trauma-informed piece is an emerging uh, emerging concept that's coming through more and more OT education programs, but I think it's something that every OT student should be hearing about um, and recognizing that so many of the populations that we work with um, experience trauma or may experience trauma in their lives. I think we need to think about um, how we can get students out into the community working with individuals experiencing homelessness more um, while they're in school and while they're conducting research. Uh, and then finally, advocating for our role within non-traditional settings like healthcare for the homeless organizations or even urban community planning and development. Um, so I think that is, is all I have for now and I'd love to take some questions. <clears throat> awesome job, Mary. Thank you so much. Your topic is so innovative. I feel as though, um, and you've, you've, you've stated this in our session today, just that it might not be on the forefront of all of our minds, your, this area of expertise and this topic, yet it affects every single community that we live in. It's just a matter of where and when and how big the problem is. So uh, there's always a role for OT everywhere. Um, and so we very much thank you for bringing this topic up. Um, I would uh, welcome some questions. You elicited some really nice chatter throughout your session, um, but we would welcome you to either raise your hand, speak up, or use the chat box to um, connect with Mary. 